Well, welcome everybody. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on what time zone you're in. And uh, I would like to welcome you to the orientation for the CWCT program. You made it, you're in, and now we've got the opportunity for the next hour to talk about the program, give you some insights. You'll hear from uh, some of the administrators. You're gonna hear from some faculty. You'll have the opportunity to ask questions and you'll actually, uh, we'll go into a breakout room here shortly. You're gonna get a email or a chat rather, keep an eye on the chat, but don't click on it yet because if you click on it, you're gonna go into your breakout session and uh, we will be going into the breakout session. It will be assigned, take a look at the list of rooms and go into the room that uh, you can join by the, by the college you've identified. So when we give you the okay, click on the room, you can go in and then we'll have a uh, uh, about 20 minute breakout session uh, with uh, your individual uh, program managers. And then we'll come back as a large group and then we'll hear about uh, some of the campus resources with Matthew. And then you'll hear more with, uh, uh, about the faculty and you'll be able to hear what they've got to say. Uh, this is really just a great opportunity for you to hear about this program. And this is a great opportunity for you to really test the water and get an idea about what cybersecurity is all about. And hopefully, hopefully you'll take an interest and this interest will blossom into uh, uh, eventually a career for you because I can tell you right now, if you haven't, you need to go out and take a look at cyberseek.org, cyberseek, S-E-E-K. And if that doesn't whet your appetite in terms of career opportunities, there are over a half a million cybersecurity related opportunities that are open now just in the United States. So if you are looking for, uh, uh, for an opportunity for a challenging, a very prosperous uh, career and a very rewarding career, you are in the, uh, you are in the right stages. Um, I can't say enough about how excited we are to kind of kick off this pilot program and for you to be part of this pilot program. So uh, again, hopefully, uh, after today, you're going to be even more excited about the program and uh, put forth the effort necessary. And, and like I've told a lot of the um, applicants, if you can get through this program and then move on and get a career in cybersecurity, whatever the discipline may be, I can tell you right now, have a very nice career because there are so many opportunities out there and they're very prosperous opportunities. Now, that being said, Nothing good comes easy. So it, it, this might not come easy all the time. You just have to work at it. But I can tell you that if you put forth the effort uh, and you can uh, eventually make this a career, you are gonna be rewarded very well. So with that, Brooke, I stole some of your thunder, I think. Um, you, everybody knows who Brooke is, I suspect, because you've all had some contact with her. Yep. I seen a lot of I've seen a lot of faces uh, that I've talked to on the phone and exchanged email with um, you know hopefully today will be an opportunity for you guys all to get a good idea of the program and and um, the resources available so um, yeah I <laughs> if you have any queries I'm always available welcome back everybody Hopefully you got to connect with your program manager and it sounds like Steve-O, your group had a nice conversation going on and Rex we extended invitations for all of us. So um, up next, we've got Matthew Cloud from Ivy Tech who's gonna be um, sharing his knowledge with us. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Good. Yes, all right. Yeah, it's sharing. Yeah. Good. All right. So I'll try to zoom in here a little bit if it lets me, but maybe not. There we go. All right. So our classes that we have are tied to certifications. And that's kind of what I wanted to go over is assessments. As all of you have taken the IT assessment, which uh, if you had fun with that, great. If, you, if that, was, that was my baby. If not, it was somebody else. Um, but 
it's our first uh, take at it to try to see if we can make it a little bit faster for people to enter into these courses. That's one of the issues we've had, and most of you seem to be doing pretty well with that. Um, what I want to show here is if you look at the site, rwcc.us, that'll take you to Northwest, um, where there's more information. I'm looking at the AI track right now. There's a list of courses that you'll take. Um, A+, plus, Security+, plus, the Cyber Ops, everybody take, unless you already have those certifications. And then in the AI track, you take Python Essentials, AI Machine Learning, and Cybersecurity, and the IoT and Hardware Security. We'll learn more about these tracks a little bit later. Um, but what I wanted to talk about is how we're using assessments and certifications. Each one of the courses, you'll have a short assessment at the beginning that's based upon the final exam um, so that we can get an idea as to how well you're learning the materials and we're using that as feedback as well as your direct feedback. So please do give that to us um, so that we can make sure that we're providing the best resources and the best education to help you reach what you need. The courses themselves are not focused on you passing a certification. That's a separate um, deal that we'll be doing. So I'll talk about that again here in just a moment. But we want you over the next eight weeks um, in this session, then you'll take another session and a third session if you're taking two classes at a time um, to make sure you have the knowledge to be able to pass those certifications, but also the practical skills that you need to work in the field. Because it's not just passing certifications, but also building out um, apprenticeships, which other uh, members of our party, uh, Rami Salahaya, who is another uh, All right, so with these certifications, if you already have the A plus certification, then you do not need to take the A plus course, which about 30 of our uh, 75 that we have right now already have the A plus certification. So there's no point for you to take that course. If you already have the certified associate in Python, then you would not have to take the Python course. Uh, otherwise, that's a required course. So we're keeping it very simple. We're not looking at uh, what prior courses you've taken because this is a nationwide effort. How do we get universities to work together? Typically, one of the problems we've had is trying to do course assessment. We're trying to get around all that by focusing on certifications. Um, then you would take in your next session, Security Plus and Cyber Ops. If you were in, let's say, instead of the AI, you were in computer forensics, you'll take a computer forensics course, which is using the ACE uh, certification that, uh, that's for forensics. If you are in the, the systems administration track, there's a Linux certification. You can either take the Linux Plus or the Red Hat systems administration. We're focusing on that particular track on Red Hat because Red Hat wants to provide internships and apprenticeships um, throughout the US as part of what they're doing with IBM and, and where that goes. Um, so that's where we're focusing on Red Hat because there's job opportunities. Um, as we look at the AI track, there's AI, AWS machine learning. There's a badge, there's not really a certification there. There is a new certification in blockchain um, tools using some Python through a company called SimpaChain. So there's a, an inexpensive one there. There's not an IoT hardware security certification, but there is an IoT security badge actually from Cisco that's recently been put out there that you could potentially get. Um, when we look at some of the other tracks, so if I back up here a little bit, and I look at like systems administration, we can see that there's uh, the EC Council Certified Ethical Hacking. There's not really a cloud systems administration certification yet. However, some of the materials being used in that uh, are also from Red Hat with OpenStack. Um, it may get into some OpenShift and containers in those areas as well. Uh, but that's a new area and as we develop it, there may be some new certifications that we offer over the course of this year. If I go back or go to uh, forensics. You can see in the first session, you have the access data, a certification. Again, the security plus and cyber ops. And this one is the EC Council certified ethical hacker as opposed to the Certified Hacking Forensics Investigation. Actually, this should be CHFI. I was gonna say, this is the wrong one that's wrong here. This is, should say Certified Hacking Forensics Investigator here on the website. Um, 
which it does here on the left, but it doesn't say that on the right. Yeah, that's uh, and, <laughs> that's okay. This is all we're, we're trying to make it happen. We had only planned to teach actually one or two courses this summer, but due to overwhelming response, we've had, I, I don't know what the number is, but when I looked a couple weeks ago, we were over 1,200 applications. Um, so we're trying to add more courses in and, and make this work as quickly as we feasibly can, um, supporting 75, possibly 90 students starting year two to seven. Any questions that you have on certifications and how does that work? at this point. And, and Matthew, we probably want to mention and, and just remind everybody that the grant pays for up to three certifications. Yes, that well, that's the next. I just want to make sure there wasn't any questions about what I've covered yet. So hopefully you can hear me well enough now. So to Christy's point, uh, yes, uh, we don't have the mechanism in place just yet, but we will here in the next week where you can select uh, up to three of the certifications. You could start on those now. You could do them separately, but we're using the new certify tool to help guide you through that process to prepare for the certifications. Taking a test is different than learning the materials. So we want to focus on you learning the materials, whether you want to do that now or, you know, six months from now, you can choose up to three certifications that we'll pay for. And as you hear about the different certification paths uh, or training paths that you're doing, some of them you may want to pay for out of pocket because it's only $50 and the grant can pay for a higher one. Uh, but that, that'll be up to you. There's, there's a, a large number of certifications. We'll be adding more to this grant as we go along. Uh, but uh, any, any questions about the certifications themselves? Matthew, we did get a question um, as far as the certifications go that they, how, how are they going to claim their certification? Like claim the, the waiver or what, how, how, how is that process going to work? So that's, that's one of the things that we're working on right now. Because that's, part of it has been, even with people taking certification exams virtually uh, over this past year, that's still, still a bit in limbo. How do people get in and get into that? Um, so I don't want to give information that we're going to change next week, but we're, we're close to how you can choose that. Uh, but the voucher process generally works that you can use that voucher through any of the uh, different testing centers. So if you have one locally that's open, uh, then you can, and that's starting to happen. It's just that a lot of those testing centers have been closed. And so because they've been closed, for maybe more than a year, they have to go through a recertification process. So they may not be available right now, but sometime over the summer, there should be a lot of testing centers open. In addition to that, um, most of these certifications you can take virtually from home, and that does not look to end anytime soon. Um, so that's kind of the pain point with certifications is that's always shifting. And they are listing more to academia on making that process easier, particularly CompTIA, uh, because they change every year. Well, every three years, uh, a certification basically gets retired and they have a new version of it come out, um, just like we're doing right now with Security Plus. That's going through a new version as we speak. Um, so there's a new one out there while the other one's being retired, but there's a little bit of a crossover happening. Um, others like the Python Essentials and Python Associate is an international board actually based out of uh, Belgium and Poland. Um, and they work with people out of Argentina and the US as well. But it, it does not tend to change quite as often, but their schedule is different. It's, it, each one's a little, a little different on that. The Cisco group is highly uh, in tune with what we're doing in academia and, and have been over backwards even before COVID. Uh, starting about two, maybe three years ago to make that easier for students uh, to make that work. And some of these things like the Cisco Cyber Ops, if you get a certain score um, at the end and you complete the coursework, they'll provide a discount voucher. Um, but again, we're also working through that. And I'd hope to have an answer for that as well. But unfortunately, our key person for that, her husband died a couple weeks ago. So I'm, I'm waiting another week on that. I know she's starting to work again, but um, I want to be cognizant of our partners. We're all human, and um, 
the goal for what we're doing with this grant is to help secure our nation and everybody is, is, is really um, uh, on task to make that happen uh, and, and ready to get out of this uh, situation we've all been in this past year and use virtual in, in a positive way. So we, we've been teaching in a virtual manner uh, long before COVID, so that part of it's new. The reason this is a pilot for us and the first course, is I'm sure we'll have some, some uh, things to get through is it's the first time we're really trying to do this as a consortium across universities where we're all teaching the same curriculum. So if we don't have any other questions on certifications, I'll uh, transition over to the faculty. Sure. All right, I think we do have one question on certifications that just came in. That is correct, Dustin. Yeah, so there's five certifications, possibly more by the time we're all said and done with it that you could take and the grant will take up to three. We'll, we'll pay for three, yes. All right, so with that, um, I'd like to start out by introducing um, our, a, our CompTIA A plus focused faculty. I'll start with Dima Yassine, I believe you're in here. If you'll Hi, yes, yourself. hello. Hello everyone, I'm Dima Yassine. Um, I'm the CompTIA uh, A plus certification instructor. Um, I, I'm here for um, any questions that you may have. Um, I am here for any help that you may need. Just let me know. Uh, thanks, Dima. And Dima will be teaching the Saturday and Sunday class, correct? That's correct, yes. Great, thank you. And then in the evening, we have Ben Marrero, who will be teaching the same class for those that are coming in the evening. If Ben, if you could say hello. Hello, everyone. I've already introduced myself a little earlier, so uh, I'm excited about this. I think we're gonna really enjoy. Uh, this is a good foundation for everything else. You, you, you wanna know about networking, you wanna know about cybersecurity, you, you need to know the tools you're working with, with, which is a computer. So learning all about the insides and outsides of a computer software, uh, everything that makes up a computer, uh, how it all comes together, that's it's going to be important for you to learn. So that's why we start out with this course. And again, uh, we'll be looking forward to, to teaching you and working with you on that. Thanks, Ben. And then kind of like a break. Uh, yeah, voice is broken. So, uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, we just finished. Ben, maybe uh, the next one who... Maybe he's introducing uh, Chuck, Professor maybe. Nervo. Who? Uh, Professor Norville, is he here? Okay, Professor Norville, okay. Yes, I'm uh, Norville Hodges, and I'll be uh, instructing the Linux administration uh, course. And uh, the fundamentals is what we're looking for. And in perspective of the certifications for um, uh, Linux Plus, as well as Red Hat. So it's gonna be a combination of that with the fundamentals of generally uh, Linux administration. Hey, thanks, Norval. Uh, can you hear me again? Yes. <laughs> great, great, thanks. All right, so I'd like to introduce Chris Roberts then for Python, which will be Saturday, uh, Saturdays as well, Saturday and Sunday. Yes, greetings. My name is Chris Roberts. Uh, I will be teaching you the Python course. Um, we will be using the Cisco content for the Python. Uh, there are two certifications available to you through the Python certification course with the consideration that you've got uh, a couple, what is it? You've got two that are paid for and you pay for the others out of pocket. Uh, the Python certifications are relatively inexpensive, so I would consider having you pay for the Python certifications out of pocket and save your vouchers for the more expensive certifications. Thanks, Chris. All right, and then we have uh, Chuck DeCastro for forensics, yes. correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, my name is Ronald DeCastro, but everybody at PMW knows me as Chuck. Um, I'll be teaching the forensics course. Um, I did, I'm a retired law enforcement officer where I did computer forensics and I was the IT officer where I did security uh, and, and all that stuff. So um, 
And now I started my career at Purdue as a security engineer. And then I had the opportunity to become faculty, which here I am today. So what I kind of bring here for the forensic part was a lot of my real life experiences that I had and frustrations that I had with the field uh, uh, on that. So I think I can bring that to the table. That would be very rewarding and make the class a lot more interesting uh, as possibly. Great, thanks Chuck. Um, and so we also have uh, other faculty that'll come along the, the way, uh, but we'll introduce those as we get closer to those, those next sessions. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to, to bring to your attention is we have a lot of other supporting faculty we've met uh, and staff. We've got a cyber range uh, lab manager, Edwina, who is here. Uh, Edwina, do you want to say hello for a minute? Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm the new manager. Um, I've been with Ivy Tech for about three years now. And so uh, somewhat familiar with this role. It's more, I guess, more of a promotion for me. <laughs> so uh, definitely happy about what I'll be doing. Thanks, Edwina. Yes, she just officially got hired Monday, but like she mentioned, she's been in, in many different roles actually at Ivy Tech uh, and is also a graduate of our cybersecurity program and uh, will be overseeing our cybersecurity support analysts, which will be out there to help support you as you go through these classes. Um, each of our institutions have, uh, the, for their PIs, they actually have graduate assistants. Uh, for Ivy Tech, we have what are called the supplemental instructors because we're just a, a community college. We don't have graduate assistants. So uh, we have a similar idea for that. And these cybersecurity support analysts are coming from across the board. They may have bachelor's or master's or an associate's degree, uh, but they're there. They've taken those courses that you're taking. Uh, except for the brand new courses that we're creating and uh, can provide technical support for you uh, on your virtual machines or whatever else you might need help with. And as we had finalized your uh, syllabi for the courses this week, there'll be a link in there that's cwct-support at ivytech.com, um, ivytech.edu, I'm sorry, ivytech.edu. And through that, it will get through that support organization uh, for you to be able to help through those issues. There'll be some other support things like if you're, you may have already encountered as you're setting up your Ivy Tech account. We have some general Ivy Tech support in, in other areas, but this will be support staff just for the participants of this grant to make sure you have what you need. All right, thank you. So now Chrissy is going to teach you all how to use all of the Ivy platforms, which I'm sure you're super excited about learning how to do so I'm going to pass it over to Chrissy to uh, teach about that. Thanks Amber. Um, I did just get a, a message that my internet connection is unstable so hopefully <laughs> um, okay. you know we'll see if this works. Um, I couldn't work from the campus today because they close at at five central so they would have kicked me out in the middle of this. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, no. Okay, um, so I am. I'm going to discuss two big pieces of, um, of technology that we, that we use and you will be using as a student. Um, you've actually already somewhat used both of these in your application process um, uh, for the assessment piece of it. So we're going to be looking at two things. We're going to be looking at My Ivy, which is your student portal, and then we're going to be looking at Ivy Learn, which is the um, the uh, online learning management platform. So Ivy Learn is where you will actually be doing your classes. Um, so there's a couple different ways to get to My Ivy. It's just myivy.ivytech.edu. Um, or if you just go to the main Ivy Tech website, which is ivytech.edu, there will be links for both my Ivy and Ivy Learn at the top. Um, but um, um, when you log in, it will probably ask for your for your information. Oh, I did. Oh, no, thanks. Now. Um, this may look different to some of you who maybe finished your, um, your steps earlier 
Um, they just changed my Ivy on us on Monday. A new, a new version went live. So this may look a little different to some of you who, again, finished your assessments a while ago. Um, and then mine may look slightly different than yours since I am a staff member of Ivy Tech um, as opposed to a student. So your quick links here will probably be slightly different um, than what is on mine. Um, but there is, um, there's a search feature here that if, if you don't see what you're looking uh, for, you can always search for it. So there are um, uh, essentially two uh, main things that you will either want to put in your favorites, or if you have them listed in your quick links, that's going to be good too. Um, your first thing you will want to have ready access to is Ivy Learn because again, that is how you are going to be doing your classes. Um, if it is not listed in your quick links, let me move you guys' video here, um, there is a see all button here that you can go in and then and essentially search for it here. Um, they are in alphabetical order. Um, and then all you'd have to do is click the little heart and it would add it to your favorites. Um, uh, and you can see here that like Ivy Learn is already in my quick links. I went ahead and added it to my favorites anyway. So it shows up over here on my favorites. So Ivy Learn is the first thing that you want to add. The second thing you are going to want to add is your student email. Um, really when you are doing classes, um, and, and participating in this program, you should really be using that IV Tech email address that you were given. Um, so the My Ivy, um, the student email is run through Google. Um, so sometimes what happens, um, so again, and it's called student email um, in, the, in the quick links. Um, let me just, just verify that because they did change it. Um, student, yeah, so student email, I'm gonna go ahead and, and add it to my favorites here. Um, but it is run through Google. So sometimes what can, or Gmail. So what sometimes can happen is if you try to log in to your Ivy Tech email, if you already have like a personal Gmail account and your password is saved, sometimes it'll take you to your personal Gmail rather than your Ivy Tech email. Um, so you'll either have to log out of your personal email or you may have to add an account. Um, and you can always Google on how to do that. It is pretty simple. Um, but you are going to want to make sure that you are um, checking your Ivy Tech email on a pretty regular basis. Um, there's another, um, in Ivy Learn, there's another way to communicate, um, but those are the two pieces um, with, with my Ivy. Now, if you were to click on my schedule, you will not see your schedule since these are workforce classes and workforce training classes. They're not for credit, so it's not gonna show up um, where it says my schedule, um, which is why um, I emailed all of you what your schedule is. So if you click on that and you're like, I don't see my schedule, that's because you're not gonna see it there since they are non-credit classes. Um, so those are the two big pieces in my Ivy is your student email and then how to get to Ivy Learn. But there are lots of other things in there too um, that you can just go in and, and explore. You're really not gonna hurt anything. Um, so from here, you can get to Ivy Learn or like I said, you could go to the just main ivytech.edu and there will be a link there. Um, I always like to open it in a new tab. It may automatically open. Um, with the new system. So here is Ivy Learn. Um, so on your dashboard, there's gonna be a lot of different um, resources. Um, this is how you can get to your courses um, once they go live, um, but you can also get to your courses here on the left um, where it says courses. This inbox is what I was telling you about. This is another way to communicate. So this is how you can directly message your instructors, um, possibly some others in your class. Um, so the main difference between your Ivy Tech email and this inbox is in this inbox, it's just gonna be communication for your classes. 
um, where your Ivy Tech email, you may get just general email from Ivy Tech in, in general, that kind of thing. So um, usually if you're communicating one-on-one -on -one with your instructors, it's going to be here in this, in this inbox. Um, but it also set up that if a message is going in and out of this inbox, it will also go to your Ivy Tech email. So um, it kind of does double duty that way. Um, but like if I, if I, as a program manager, were to send an email to your Ivy Tech email, you'd have to check it through your student email. It would not go in this inbox. So that's the big difference between the two. Um, here under courses is where your courses will show up. Now, if you go under there now, you will not see your courses listed. They will not go live in the system until it's typically the Saturday before um, the session starts or 48 hours before the session starts. So June 7th is when classes start. Um, so Saturday, June 5th is when you should see um, the classes listed here under um, courses. Um, uh, and hopefully that works out all right. But essentially you would just, and I've got a lot of stuff on here because I'm, uh, you know, this could be where you're in different groups. This is how you got to your IT assessment, things like that. I am actually going to go in um, to one of my previous classes just to show you what it'll look like. Um, um, and, and this isn't one of our classes, but all classes are gonna be set up very similar. Um, so this is the four credit version of the A plus class um, that you guys are gonna be taking. This is the Ivy Tech hardware software class. Um, and this, this will also be set up somewhat like your IT assessment was, um, but you're always gonna have your home and this has the different links to get your, to your different modules, um, a link to your syllabus. Um, this is where um, announcements will be put from your instructor, things like that. Um, and then it's, it's very um, easy to use. You can go to the announcement section, your syllabus, um, your modules, your classes will probably be split up into different modules. Um, and that's where um, you're going to have some overviews and, um, and, and what you're actually supposed to be doing um, for each module, that kind of thing. Um, and then there will be a Zoom link. So all of our classes are virtual live classes. So um, the Zoom information for your classes should be here under this, um, this Zoom part. Um, and then, um, so it, it may look a little different, but, but that's, that's the basic overview of, of how you're going to navigate Ivy Learn um, to do your classes. So I see a couple things in the chat. Uh, yeah, okay, so just comments. So yeah, so that's how Ivy Learn um, is. Um, and then, um, so Ivy Learn is run through Can Canvas is the actual like uh, company that runs it. There is a Canvas app that you can download so that you can, um, you know, look at the calendar online um, on your phone. So um, if you just download the Canvas app, you would need to use your Ivy Tech information uh, to kind of log on for it and connect it with your classes. So that's another important feature um, to, to, uh, to recommend. So I think that's pretty much everything. Um, does anybody have any questions? Oh, Jason, yes, where would you view the recorded session? Um, so let me actually look at that. Um, let me show you. Um, because the, my classes were, the, that was an online class. Um, let me find, I'm trying to find my server administration class. Here it is. So if you go under that Zoom link, that should also be where the recorded, uh, the recorded meetings are. So it will list the upcoming meetings, the previous meetings, and then here are your cloud recordings. Um, so this was like, I took this one virtually. Um, so these are um, all of the, uh, the recorded uh, class sessions. Um, so it will be very similar for these classes as well. So it would be under that Zoom link as well. 
Okay. And every once in a while, you know, something goes wrong with Zoom because we all know that this internet stuff is not perfect. <laughs> so it, if something happens there, then under the announcements, um, the instructor should make an announcement there if they needed to, to save it to an alternate location. And there was a time, I've been doing virtual instruction for, for almost 30 years, actually. Um, and it, it's only been the past year where it's been somewhat reliable. I, I, I you know, dare say that. <laughs> but you know, even a couple of years ago, I often had go to meeting and other things open because one would go down and we have to go to the other. So thankfully, it's become much more reliable and built right into our learning system. Thanks, Matthew. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Um, and I think those are all the questions. Um, yeah. So if you have any, you know, you get on to Ivy Learn, sometimes the first day of classes can always be the most difficult because especially if you're new to using it, but the instructors should be very um, uh, understanding of it and, and help you along. Um, but that will be how you get to your Zoom meetings and the recordings and all of that. So, all right, Amber, if you want to take it to the next. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chrissy. Um, so rather than doing breakout rooms, because that was a hot mess and we're not going to do that again, um, if, the, if the PIs could just go over um, the three different tracks in the main room, you all have sharing privileges. So if, um, if we could just go with that. Michael, do you want to get started with the forensics track? Sure, I can. Uh, yeah, this is the forensic one. Let me share my uh, screen. Uh, okay, so uh, everybody, can you uh, read my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So I, I guess everybody has seen, probably have seen this web page, right? So we don't want to go through the, 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 the page layout. So, but instead I will. Uh, talking about the program overview and uh, maybe the, the uh, you know, training pairs, the forensic one. Okay, so. Um, so I think uh, Matthew has already introduced the, the uh, some of the like a course, right? So we do have uh, for the forensic uh, track, we have six course and uh, we have three core course. So those are A plus course and uh, uh, cyber ops and security plus. So the A plus course, you know, I think everybody knows, you know, it's mainly about the computer system. Uh, the cyber ops is mainly focused on the um, network. Well, the security process uh, covers the fundamentals of cyber security. So I think these are all uh, were fundamental uh, concepts, knowledge, or skills for you know anybody who doing anything in the cyber security field. So I want we want the, everybody to have some of the fundamental uh, skills in this area. And uh, for the forensic track, we do have three uh, forensic course. Okay, three forensic course. So we have the uh, First course is computer forensic, uh, we call like forensic fundamentals or basics. Uh, I think, you know, uh, when, you know, just one minute, I can ask uh, one of the instructor Chuck to talk about the details as he will be the person to teach, uh, teach this course. And uh, well, I'm the one who designs the course. So then we will have a, a, another uh, two, um, well, the, um, you know, I think it's the, the, the elective course quite a course as well, right? So mobile forensic and the computing hacking and forensic investigator. So mobile forensic, we were talking about the, um, well, uh, tools, right? FTK, Certified, UFED, um, and, uh, uh, you know, about the cell phone uh, messages, right? And the chat form and uh, some of the contacts and PDS files, all those things, all those stuff or like SQLite, right, database. So we can um, investigate what's actually inside, right, in the database, uh, you know, the client database is a very lightweight database file. And then computer hacking and forensic investigator. So I have taken this a uh, long, long time ago, like 15 years ago for CHFI. So, um, but I know that's it's basically talking about the, uh, something about cybersecurity, something about 
uh, forensics and how you can investigate. Okay. So uh, Chuck, do you want to like take a couple of minutes talking about what we will cover in the forensic course? Wow, how long did I have? I mean, it's going to be a lot. Uh, <laughs> we're going to cover pretty much well. Uh, the beginning will be able to cover the, the law itself, right? Um, and what you should watch out for, because if you don't do everything correctly, then it won't be accepted in a court, whether it's civil, uh, criminal, or even um, if you don't violate a policy from a company, it won't be accepted in um, grievance committees, right? Then after that, we're going to get how do you acquire the evidence, uh, how to protect it, um, and we're going to be using this uh, uh, FTK tool to, to show that. And of course, you know, what to look out for, uh, um, uh, what kind of evidence, or we call them artifacts, uh, what to look out for, where you can find them. And we're going to go into, you know, a little bit of detail about that. Uh, we're going to cover, of course, how to use the tool. And then, you know, and where to find certain things. And of course, documentation is another important thing. How would you document that? Uh, how would you preserve your, 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 your case or your documentation? Because uh, in reality, when you do computer forensics, or well, at least my background uh, is that, you know, you do your case and then the case does not go to court, does not go to uh, until a couple of years. So documentation itself is very important. Okay, so we're going to learn all that uh, uh, in that course, but that's just a very brief uh, a description of what uh, we're going to do, and that's I'm going to open up. If anybody have any questions about the course itself and about the material, uh, please ask. But we're going to cover all that uh, uh, during uh, the course itself. But it's a very interesting course. Uh, I'm actually really excited, probably more excited than you guys that actually teach it, um, but um, it's going to be fun. Thank you, Chuck. So I think we also cover a lot of things about the uh, Windows part, the forensic part, right? So Windows uh, Pane, Forensics, Registry, view, registry Windows Registry, um, Password Cracking, um, Internet Applications, right? So those are all we will cover in the forensic course. So there were lots of materials and, uh, you know, Chuck will work with you guys, right? Um, you know, if you are registered in those course. So, um, so for forensics, we do have, uh, uh, well, some of the course, they have like prerequisites, right? Like the uh, forensic course, we do hope that you will have a fundamental uh, knowledge on the computer systems, uh, what is like operating system, what is about like bytes, bits, and uh, you know, uh, how to convert from um, right hex, decimal. I think they will have some of the labs. So we will uh, require you to go through that, but I think and the instructor will lead you through those labs. And uh, um, yeah, so, but anyway, if you have some basic uh, concepts about the computer systems, that would be great. So, um, well, uh, everybody will need to take this tool for, you know, security plus and then SAPOPS, right? And then um, the last phase you are taking is about mobile forensics. So you already know basic about forensics. So we don't need to introduce the uh, you know, tools itself, we don't need to talk about what it's like, okay, so this uh, internet or registry things, right? We say, okay, we need, you need to look at the registry, okay, we need to look at the, you know, file system, then you will know where to go and uh, like click on FTK, the tool, right, where you, you need to go. So that's only one thing I would like to emphasize for this is that we have to use the, um, uh, what we call is a commercial tool, right? So FDK is our basic tool and also UFED, which is also commercial tool. Uh, so we will use both of that. And there are many, many, many other uh, tools, which most of them are for uh, Windows based, right? Uh, Chuck, correct? So the, you need to have like Windows machine, um, but we are trying to work on uh, to set up a environment so you can remote log into those systems and the system will install with the tool install with the, uh, you know, data files. I think they should be there. So Adwina, we're working with Adwina. Um, and um, then, you know, um, yeah. So if you want to do it by yourself, right? Some of you guys want to, okay, I want to have access, uh, you know, you install a local copy of the tools. Uh, that's fine. So you can install and we will provide the video. I think the video is already there to, you know, where to download and how to install and how to, what well, we will demonstrate how to build the, you know, the case, right? Uh, to use the tool in the class. But, you know, for, if you want to do it by yourself, then you have to use a Windows machine, okay? Windows machine. So that's all uh, you need to, um, you know, to, to, 
to know. Okay, so I think uh, I have gone through uh, too much, right? Five minutes. So it's. Um, do you have any question about the forensics? I see there's a uh, message popping up, but I cannot see that. <laughs> it was just an openware suggestion, openware tool suggestion. Okay. Okay. That's great. Okay. So um, about the certification, right? Uh, I think this one's wrong, right? So we have to update the web page, okay? Right, not, not CH. <laughs> so um, yeah, the other part should be fine, okay? Should be fine. So uh, there were, you know, as Chuck talking about, you know, they will have a lot of things we work together and um, lots of hands-on. I think forensic courses like 70% will be hands-on, right? Okay, so you have to follow the instructors, you may have to, you know, uh, you know work on the lab, some of the labs, hands-on labs in class. And I have taken like many, many of those forensic, uh, you know, training. So, uh, you know, the all hands-on, so. Okay, so the next, uh, um, if you don't have questions, so then that next book to uh, Farina, right? I saw Farina there. You know, before we get to Farina, there's a good question in there. Mm -hmm. um, about the certifications and retaking part of the one of the ways we're trying to make sure that you're ready to take the certification is the you certify uh, tool that we're using to prepare you for it it will have test prep and you should not actually take the certification until you're scoring above 90 percent on the test prep in that tool so ideally you won't have to take retakes yeah we will like we will have like preparation you know like forensic course we will uh, give you like some practical questions, right? That's a very close, or you know, it's closely or very close to the actual exam. So we will give you a sample, some sample, um, uh, you know, like image, right? You're working on and then you will test whether I can get 80%, right? Or, or, or 90%. So then you, are, then you are ready to take. So we will give you the, uh, some of the material, practical quiz and uh, maybe instruction. The only thing we don't do is we will not give lecture, right? And uh, Chuck, correct? So the last two weeks is for you to prepare by yourself. Or oh, you will decide that, oh, I will take it, waiting for another few minutes. Uh, Michael, if I can add also, if they're taking the cyber ops, we're using actually the Cisco Connecticut Academy where they can actually take a sample fine certification exam. They can take the certification sample exam before they, uh, we can open this, they can take it as many times certification um, exam so they could get ready for the actual certification exam. Yeah. That's right. All of the Cisco related courses, which are the IT essentials, which is that A plus material, uh, the Python essentials, the uh, cyber ops course, all of those have test prep built into those. Any of those that are more, more independent of Cisco, we're using you certified to help prepare them uh, to, to be ready. Right. Okay. Thank you, Michael. All right. I, I, I wanted to add one other thing. Michael mentioned about the last two weeks. There's eight weeks of course instruction. There's two weeks in between each session. That's what he was referring to. There's 10 weeks between each cycle of sessions that we have. There's a two week dead period, if you will. And you could force yourself to go through the certifications in two weeks, which works well for some people, but you could take you know six months to prepare for it if you need to. It, it really depends upon your unique situation. We want to help you get there. All right, so um, I just want to make sure, do, are we going with the um, uh, uh, system administration or we can get started with the AI track? Go ahead and go for the AI track, Okay. Marina. All right, sounds good. So thanks, um, Michael, you have uh, uh, briefly explained what the forensics track is and that's going to help me um, cover some of the aspects of the AI track. So this is another track which goes in parallel. Some of the students have picked the um, AI track um, like the others. In the AI track, we have three core courses, which is common among all the three tracks, which is A+, uh, Security+, and Cyber Ops. In the pilot program, you have two sessions which uh, you can pick from. Um, and it's basically if you pick or uh, the session is full, then you have to pick the, the other one. Um, you, you can complete your pilot session. Uh, in the pilot session, two courses from AI. One is one of the core course, and the other one is one of the specialized course of the AI program, which is Python Essentials. Um, like 
what Matthew uh, mentioned in his uh, in, uh, introductory uh, in, uh, information that if you have already the certification of the Python certification, um, the Python associate certification, then you, you can wave off. But if you don't have it, then ideally during the pilot session, you can take two of the courses um, for the AI track. And this goes for the next session, which starts in August. You, can, you will be offered two additional courses, which are the Cy Security Plus and Cyber Ops. Um, and in the third session, which is uh, starting in October, uh, two courses that are AI, uh, machine learning and cybersecurity, and IoT and hardware security will be offered. So if you can follow the program and the schedule, uh, if it's your uh, schedule with the other um, um, your uh, your your schedule routine, then you can be done by end of this year if you are taking two courses per session. Um, so um, again, for the last two courses, AI um, and IoT in hardware security, Python is a prerequisite. So you are required to take that course before you can take these two courses. Um, we will be using Python in some of the modules. Uh, where we can discuss further, Matthew can talk more about the AI course, um, and I can cover the details of IoT um, and hardware security. But I, I'll come to the content. Uh, uh, I mean, right away, I just want to discuss that the uh, the session plan for this, uh, the, the plan of study is also available. You can refer to this, or you have been receiving emails where you can um, plan your uh, your courses, how you are going to take. So if if you pick um, two courses every session, you can be done by uh, mid of December. Or if you pick one course every session, then uh, your tentative timelines will be to complete by August of 2022. All right. So I think the uh, core courses have uh, thoroughly covered by uh, the two presenters, uh, Matthew, as well as uh, Michael. I'm not going to cover too much of on that. It's an overlap. Um, for Python essentials, we are uh, we are going to cover the basics of Python. Um, um, Matthew, do you want to add more on that uh, for the Python essentials? Uh, no, we'll have some introductory materials on how to use Python in each of these tracks. So. Um, in, in particular, in this this uh, summer session, there there are some seats open currently. So if we get to the week before classes and there's some open seats, and if you're in maybe the systems admin track or the forensics track, and you'd like to take a Python course and there's seats open, you're welcome to take it as well. Um, and uh, because it's something that would be a, a good skill for any of the tracks, quite honestly, much like Linux or um, well, yeah, the, the other Linux course that we have out there. So. Um, the only other thing that I would add is that we're going to get into, you know, for the AI stuff, we're not going to get deep into coding. It's not intended to be programming and development and becoming a software developer, but how to use Python, Python within the cybersecurity skills, what are the cr critical skills? And then even with the AI type work, we're focusing a lot on fifth generation languages, going light on Python, but you need to know how to do that when, when, the, when the stuff that, that's writing the code for you how do you tweak it to make it work right? That's what we're really going for. And that's where the, the, the greatest amount of jobs are supposed to be something like uh, 75 million jobs replaced by 123 million AI enhanced jobs by 2025. Hello. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> All right. Oh, for what taking the, <laughs> the Python. <laughs> Sorry, this. Yeah, that's an amazing statistic you mentioned there, Matthew. I did my undergrad and grad also did it for artificial intelligence. This is amazing how those AI jobs will take over a lot of our redundancy jobs. When you walk to bank right now, you see a lot of this chaos station instead of seeing a human being. Right, right. And there were a couple of questions in here about uh, moving from one course to the next. Yes, we plan to automatically register you into the next session. Uh, but we are, um, uh, it's pass fail. So you'll be given a grade throughout the course, but it's pass fail, right? All right. All right. So uh, for the IoT and hardware security, this is a, this is more like um, 
introduction to the hardware that goes beyond the applications. Um, and we will focus on, it, by looking at the device, how vulnerable this device is, we, have, uh, we are developing some very interesting labs where the cryptography or security via encryption confidentiality by encryption is achieved, we will uh, perform some operations or labs where you can break the key. You can break in the key by just list um, without being invasive by listening to the power traces. Um, we are going to try to provide you the equipment so you can work from your home and uh, uh, design those labs. We do plan to cover embedded devices, which is um, basically what the what is the composition or architecture of IoT devices, what are the security um, vulnerabilities for those devices. And uh, one of the component is on the communication security, which probably is, is an overlap, um, but we will briefly cover the communication level security in the IoT because all the IoT devices are connected devices. Uh, but majority of the uh, curriculum will focus on the device level itself, that what are the security vulnerabilities, whether a device which is implementing encryption is it still considered secure or not? And you will break in the keys and you will see how insecure it is to if you use, for example, advanced encryption scheme or AES, uh, which is pretty much a standard uh, being used by the industry right now. Um, so it, it, it is more of uh, an embedded course where you will uh, get to have some hands-on experience and uh, know how of what the hardware looks like and how it talks to um, the uh, uh, from operating system up to the applications. All right. Um, the other course is uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, Matthew, would you, would you like to explain a little bit on that? I'm not sure I can explain a little bit more, but um, basically it's an intro level. Uh, there's the uh, AWS machine learning badge, which we'll have included in it, as well as going into Simba chain blockchain. So how do we tie those technologies together to create secure coding techniques, um, as well as predict where there's possible areas of a breach. Uh, that's, that's the main emphasis there. There's so much to cover in AI that it can be uh, kind of overwhelming at times, but this is an idea to get you started in it with some practical skills that can actually make, um, make a difference. And then you may wanna take additional work beyond that. And that gets more into typically graduate work, but we're looking at how we might Add additional courses in the future, even additional tracks in the future. That's great. All right. And so wait, Farina, there was a question in the chat, and I think it was based more on what you were saying. Uh, Gabe asked, "Are these Arduino type labs, RTOS devices?" Uh, that's an interesting question. So we are actually picking uh, a more uh, hardware, which is FPGAs, Field Programmable Gate Arrays. These are system on chip, so you will be able to work on the microprocessor level as well. It's almost like a Raspberry that has zinc processor on it, uh, sorry, ARM processor on it, as well as it also has a hardware component, which is referred as programmable logic. So you can actually go at the transistor level and program it using uh, hardware languages. So it is going to give you an overview of the composition of uh, IOTs that can be, um, uh, so we are going to get the example from ARM processor uh, which is uh, also based on Raspberry Pis. Uh, you can also do some labs on the microcontrollers like uh, uh, that is on the Arduino board. Uh, but they, because it's a hardware security flavor of IoT, uh, you are going to also work on the FPGA boards. All right. I, I, I hope that answers your question, but you're, feel free to ask if you, if you need any clarification. And then Aaron asked, um, AES is easy to decrypt, question mark. It, so, so decryption is okay. So encryption and decryption are normal flows of the, of the process. But if we can, the, the secrecy of the key is very important. So if you break in the key, then anybody can decrypt it and anybody can know what the normal unencrypted data can look like. So our, um, effort here would be to break in the key that is used to encrypt 
because the same key is used to decrypt. And it's it's almost like you didn't encrypt anything. You are sending the raw data, I mean, the raw form, no security. Um, and that's what, you know, we'll, be, we'll see. It's about 100% uh, breaking in the system by using the side channel attacks. Wonderful. Thank you, Farina. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. All right. And then, Meng Zhang, do you want to speak about um, the systems administration, systems admin sure. program? Sure. I, I will try my best to explain. <laughs> and uh, Michael and uh, Matthew, yeah, you guys can uh, welcome jump in if I miss something. Um, uh, just uh, maybe focus on the uh, cloud, right? Linux course. Uh, so here, uh, I just still uh, use the same uh, kind of the uh, web page um, from the cwct.us. So basically, um, uh, you can see that uh, here uh, is the, I, I kind of zoomed, um, there a track for their system administration. So on the system administration, uh, it's, um, it's uh, I, would, I would say that a little bit different from their um, uh, other uh, training on, on system administration. Uh, because we uh, kind of more focus on the Linux side, and uh, we also include a course uh, for the cloud um, administration, which is, uh, uh, in my opinion, relatively new. And uh, we, <clears throat> of course, there are many different type of, uh, sorry, um, with, uh, there are different type of uh, platforms like the AWS and the Google uh, Cloud, and also um, like the Azure, uh, when Microsoft. Uh, sorry for my <laughs> my son. Um, the but here actually um, we we were mainly focused on uh, uh, open source um, cloud uh, platform called OpenStack. Um, so uh, yeah, before we uh, talk about that, I, I still want to uh, kind of uh, let you see the uh, the general kind of structure of this track. So we have the three core courses that cross board tracks, right? So that uh, in this pilot session, um, you already know that this uh, CompTIA A plus will be offered uh, as well as one advanced uh, courses in uh, for particular for their system administration track, which is Linux system administration. Um, and we only offer one session in the pilot uh, session. Uh, so, um, I see that it uh, seems like uh, there are uh, some more demands uh, from their, uh, from our um, participants. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, we can only offer one. And um, in the pipe, in the, officially the first session uh, starting in um, August, uh, we have um, both um, this uh, Linux administration, uh, CompTIA A+, plus, as well as um, two other courses, uh, but those, uh, are covering this um, 105 and 115, which uh, um, essentially the security plus and uh, cyber ops, because the two more, I mean, two advanced courses uh, for this track, uh, like their uh, 225 um, ethical hacking. Uh, you, if you look at their, uh, I, I think it's, sorry, I, I even couldn't, couldn't see myself. Uh, Prerequisite oh, here doesn't say the prerequisite, but essentially they have uh, because of their um, uh, their requirements. They essentially have prerequisites like the ethical hacking require you have taken uh, taken uh, Linux system administration and uh, I think oh, um, as well as the uh, security plus. Uh, I think it's uh, both um, this one and uh, this one. Yeah, that's that's the. Uh, if my memory is not wrong, then that's the prerequisite for ethical hacking. And uh, for cloud administration, uh, it requires Linux system administration and uh, cyber ops. So means that in um, session one, um, we will, um, you will be able to uh, take uh, four courses so far, uh, essentially uh, those four. And in the, um, um, the session two, uh, starting in August, uh, uh, sorry, not August, October, uh, you will be able to take in, uh, those two courses. So if uh, you can take two courses every session, then 
uh, essentially by the end of the year, <laughs> you can finish all six courses. Of course, kind of challenging, I understand. Um, but just want to give you an idea, okay, not all courses will be offered in every session, especially for their, uh, um, the courses, the last two courses, they will be only offered uh, in, in some session. So uh, you probably want to pay attention uh, to the sessions uh, or their uh, cycles uh, that will be, uh, th those course will be offering, okay? And um, you, um, so there, um, the system, Linux system administration, we basically will be using uh, Red Hat uh, uh, system uh, and uh, for both uh, teaching material and also lab materials. So you will be able to uh, use uh, a virtual uh, environment um, uh, to access, um, but it, it's a real a Linux system just running in uh, within the uh, virtual machines. So uh, you will have a lot of uh, hands-on practice uh, for this one. And I believe uh, I saw some comments that essentially uh, uh, are very uh, eager for this course. I think that, yeah, definitely you will learn a lot about Linux administration. And um, after that, um, the ethical hacking is quite different. It's, um, it's a very uh, important course if you really want to understand the cybersecurity. Uh, basically, if you check the, uh, the course description here, um, it will cover the basic of penetration testing, uh, including the network protocols, um, common network security uh, problems, and scanning techniques, and the different type of, of security issues at the different levels, like the OS, like uh, application database. Um, and um, I think it will also touch some uh, bit of social engineering. Um, but in general, the content for this course will be of, um, essentially um, be enough or should be sufficient for the EC uh, Council that uh, certification exam. Okay. So um, the last part um, will be the cloud system administration, as I explained. Uh, so we uh, will cover um, the, how, um, suppose you are a cloud administrator for OpenStack, then um, you should, uh, then uh, after taking this course, you should be able to do the normal operations like the, how to create an instance, how to deploy um, the, uh, instance, how to create a user, how to assign created roles and assign roles, how to create a network router and uh, something like that. But uh, at the same time, we also want to I mean, um, talk about the commercial uh, platforms like the AWS and uh, Google uh, uh, Cloud. So, um, but that uh, we depends on um, the time availability, we may not be able to, to uh, provide the same kind of coverage. And we also will touch um, their Windows system administration within the cloud, okay? So um, that's the basic idea of those courses. I see, I, I believe there are some questions. Um, uh, oh, just to some comments, okay. Okay. yeah, okay. Yes. So um, essentially uh, we want to um, give you um, um, their uh, knowledge and skills uh, for doing some, um, some, um, I would say the entry level uh, cloud administration, uh, because the um, you understand that the most of the cloud system are really running on on top of Linux. That's why we need to learn uh, Linux, and also um, there are a lot of uh, networking um, kind of uh, uh, knowledge um, for for uh, operating on a cloud system. So that's why uh, we also require their. Um, the, the, the Cisco ops and uh, the ethical hacking provide uh, some necessary uh, in, uh, knowledge and skills uh, because nowadays uh, when most of their applications and systems are migrated into uh, one of the cloud uh, platforms, then essentially um, the, the cloud system become the target, the essential target for, for most of the attacks. And uh, so that's why uh, this ethical hacking uh, is very important for successful cloud administration. Okay. So uh, I hope uh, that uh, give you some general idea of, their, um, of the courses we will be uh, providing. And um, uh, although I would say that uh, that's just three courses, but uh, the topic actually 
cover a lot of courses you will be taking in a college education. So, so that's the challenge, yeah. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, Rami, do you wanna introduce our special guest? Yes, I'm seeing if uh, uh, we have today here, we have Luke, is Luke here with us? And Martha, so I think they're gonna log in any second right now here, I'm trying to communicate with them. Uh, Brian O'Hara is here, hey Brian, you here? Hi Rami, yeah, I'm here, how are you? Good, Brian, go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, we're gonna get started to talk. Uh, Mr. O'Hara is gonna be talking about cybersecurity jobs in the US government. And also we have two more guests, uh, Luke McCormick and Martha Doris, who's gonna also join us very shortly here. So Brian, you gonna get started? Yeah, sure. Hi, Rami. Thanks for asking me to get on the call. Um, Rami contacted me and we discussed talking about government jobs because I currently work as a special government employee for the FBI office in Indianapolis. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've been working with the FBI on and off now for close to 10 years in different capacities in this latest um, this latest role as part of the private sector outreach efforts by the FBI is, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a new position. Um, I wish I had had a little more time. I've got some resources that I can share with Rami that he can pass on to the students later about some of the efforts that are currently going on inside the FBI. I'll speak specifically to them rather than the federal government overall, but uh, they are recruiting very hard right now for uh, both women and minorities. Um, they have not done a great job of that in the past. Um, there are a very small number of women in upper management and even fewer uh, women or minorities in other upper management positions. So they are, they are uh, recruiting very heavily. There's actually a recruiting uh, effort going on this month. That's what I don't have the, the links for that I can send you to send you later, Rami. You have to log into my FBI email and get those to be able to send them to you. But they're, um, they're having recruiting events all over the country um, where they have FBI offices. I believe it's the rest of the the rest of May and maybe part of June where they're having uh, actual on-site recruiting events. Um, <clears throat> they've been recruiting heavily in, um, not that they would hire them, but they they have been uh, doing outreach work in the high schools, uh, especially in conjunction with the um, uh, the Cyber Patriot program and some of the other efforts that that Rami's been involved in. Um, yeah, so uh, they have an internship program. Uh, I mistakenly gave some of our students uh, some misinformation the last time we talked about this, Rami, and have not yet been able, to, I'm actually headed to the headquarters office tomorrow for a meeting to talk about some of this so that I can get accurate information about where students might go for internship opportunities. Um, it, it sounds as though it actually goes through national headquarters but then it pipes back down to the local office where the student would be uh, would be resident. Um, if you all didn't know this, uh, the FBI has nine offices in the state of Indiana, so there are um, internship opportunities all over the state. We have offices, if you didn't know it, in uh, Fort Wayne, in Gary Merrillville, in uh, Terre Haute, uh, Richmond, Muncie, Jeffersonville. Evansville, New Albany. I think that's it. That's a lot of offices, though. Most of them are fairly uh, small staff uh, operations, but they're still offices around the state. Uh, what else, Rami? Uh, <laughs> Brian, can you talk a little bit about the FBI InfoGuard, a little bit with that could really benefit our veteran student here. A lot of them ex-government. And also, I'm gonna, we have here, Luke, also just join us. Welcome, Luke, also to the meeting. Yeah, sure, sure, Thank sure. You. So, so that's kind of how Rami and I met a while back. I was the previous president for the InfraGuard chapter in Indiana, which is fairly large. It's about roughly around 1,500 members now statewide, um, and we were involved. Uh, that is also a private sector program with the FBI. They have something called the Office of the Private Sector (OPS), and there are several programs that fall under that InfraGuard being probably the largest one. They have another one called the Citizens Academy um, and then the Strategic Engagement Advisor Program, which is what I'm part of. Um, so 
um, there are opportunities for any and all of you to get involved at the state and national level through InfraGuard. It's, uh, it costs nothing to join. They will ask you for your social security number because they do a background check on you. Um, can I see, a, I got to see a bunch of pictures. Can I see a set of hands of anybody on the call who's actually a member besides Rami and I? Any of you? Yeah, it doesn't look like anybody. Yeah, no, it's I'm a member too. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's free to join, and uh, you'd be amazed. I'm actually getting bombarded for the first time in a number of years with emails every day about trainings that are free going on all over the country. Uh, there are 85 chapters of of InfraGuard in the United States, and they do all of them do different kinds of things. Some of the smallest chapters are 20 people. Some of the largest chapters, uh, Houston, for instance, has. Um, the city of Houston chapter, I think alone is over a thousand members. Um, and they're constantly doing online training about um, threats to our critical infrastructures. So I would encourage any of you to join it. Like I said, it's free. You just fill out a simple, uh, simple uh, application, go to www.infraguard. Uh, it's spelled kind of funny, I-N-F-R-A-G-A-R-D.org. Um, I always have to tell this horrible story about why it's spelled that way. Uh, the program started in 1995 up at the Cleveland office as a way of involving the private sector to help the FBI um, manage threats to our critical infrastructures. And at that time, they were they were thinking about things like, um, you know, aircraft, uh, trains, people putting bombs on trains, all kinds of weird stuff like that. Um, and they, they had to come up with a name for the program and they, <laughs> somebody, some genius decided to take the U out of the word guard. And the tagline was the only thing missing from InfraGuard is you. <laughs> Got it. Anyway, that's right. why it's I-N-F-R-A-G-A-R-D dot org. It's free to join. Um, I will tell you that in Indiana, um, they're currently not, I don't want to say they're not accepting student applications, but they really want individuals who are involved in our critical infrastructures. That's what the program is really about. Um, that doesn't mean that they won't let you become a member, but they're not actively recruiting students. If you are a faculty or someone working in a critical infrastructure, I would strongly encourage you to join so that you can pipeline information to your students about the different programs and trainings that go on around the country. Now that COVID has kind of started to loosen up too, you'll see more activities in Indiana. In the past year, it's been pretty quiet. Um, but again, I, I'm getting hammered constantly with, uh, I think today alone, I saw eight different trainings on topics from everything from ransomware to um, different kinds of um, uh, telephone heist that criminals, that uh, cyber criminals are trying to, uh, propagate against the elderly stuff like that so it's just all kinds of free stuff to get it's a it's a great program i would strongly encourage you to join again it's also um they don't necessarily post things about jobs for students or people graduating going out into the field but it's a it's a great way for you to network it's how i met rami years ago it's a great way to network with other professionals around the state who are involved in cr protecting our critical infrastructure as well as getting involved with law enforcement and knowing a little bit more about what they're involved in and what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Just like wait, there, there's, there's some questions in the chat. Um, sure. Brian, can you speak? Because our, our participants are from all over the United States, so not yeah, just sure. the state of Indiana. Sure, um, sure. So one of the questions is, does the FBI positions allow for remote work, or do you have any information about um, the offices in different states and what they might be able to provide? Um, sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Do they? Well, it just do they... says, do you know if any of the FBI positions allow for remote remote work? I live in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and would like to remain here if possible. So, well, let's it, let's put it this way: they they have they have been doing a lot of remote work because of COVID, but that's not their specialty. Their specialty is on site, hands on, uh, doing criminal investigation work. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that they're very much they're not as it's not as hardcore as it used to be, but they're very much like a military organization in that um, if you, it's a career you decide to go into, um, they'll pick and put you anywhere in the country or the world that they need you. 
and that could happen today, tomorrow. They'll say, oh, sorry, you got to be in Vietnam tomorrow. And that's just <laughs> the way it works. Um, so a lot of what they do is done from remote offices. But remember, they're an investigative um, organization. And so they're very hands on with the kinds of stuff that they do. You couldn't, for instance, do um, evidence recovery work uh, remotely. You have to be on the site of a crime. Uh, you can do a lot of cyber analysis remotely, but at some point you're going to have to testify in court. You have to fill out paperwork for um, uh, warrants, that kind of stuff. So it's it doesn't lend itself to, hey, I know this code stuff. I can sit over in Nebraska and do some work for them. It doesn't lend itself to that very well. Are there more questions? Um, yeah, there was a comment about InfraGuard. Uh, so I guess somebody tried to apply yesterday and they got a message that InfraGuard program is not currently accepting new applications. We will reopen the application process in the near term as we transition to a new application form. So it looks like the application might be temporarily shut down while they transition to a new form, I guess. Yeah, it could be that, and I don't know about that. I can ask tomorrow, but it also could be that they're not accepting applications at that office at this time. I'm not sure what state they're in. As far as I know, I've not gotten anything from headquarters that they're not accepting uh, new applications. So it could be that they're simply not in that particular area, if that makes sense. Because I know, for instance, in Indiana, that they, I know for a fact that they are accepting applications because I know the woman who's the one that stamps them and gives them to the agents to approve and stuff. So, so I would say just keep checking back. Um, and if they want more specific information, um, I think Rami, you've got my email address. I'm more than happy. It's just btohara at fbi.gov. Um, and I'm happy to try and respond as best I can to any, any questions that you, that you might have. Yeah. And one more question, um, is yeah, sure, if there's sure. an, if there's an age limit, um, it just says, what is the age limit if there is one? To be an InfraGuard member? They did, They weren't specific in their question. Oh, yeah. To be an InfraGuard member, you have to be 18. Yeah, you have to be an adult. That's that's as far as I know. Um, I will say this. If you have committed a crime in the past, you need to be honest about it on your application. If you, if you simply omit information, you'll get blacklisted and you'll never become a member. Be honest on your application. Tell them because have being convicted of a crime is not necessarily a uh, reason to deny your membership into InfraGuard because you're not getting any kind of a clearance. You're not getting access to classified information. You're simply belonging to an organization. And there are, uh, there are members who have committed crimes, um, not, you know, murder or bank robberies, that kinds of stuff. But, you know, you might've had uh, traffic inflections. Uh, you know, you might've had other stuff. I don't know, but, but it's not a complete denial of you can't be a member. The one thing they will not put up with is lying or admitting information. They will they will blacklist you in a heartbeat if they catch you doing that. It's you know I mean typical of the FBI. You know it's a federal crime actually to lie to the FBI. Thank Bellamy. you for this great information, uh, Brian. Sure. Really appreciate it. I'd like to if also. Other, yeah, if I'd... there's other questions, I'd be glad to, to to you know take any others as well. There usually is with the InfraGuard and the FBI stuff because there's a lot of interest in it. Okay, thank you very much for the for the information. This is really great information. Uh, also, sure. I'd like to introduce today, Mr. Luke McCormick. Luke, you get started. Introduce yourself and tell us about your experience with the U.S. government and jobs in, in the U.S. government. Sure. Uh, Luke McCormack, I am the um, 26 years of federal service. Prior to that, I had uh, several years in a variety of private sector roles um, before entering the federal service. Thought at the time that I was going to enter the federal service, it would be kind of fun. I was doing some pretty cool stuff in the private sector and, uh, you know, caught the federal service bug, if you will, and, uh, and stayed there for another uh, 25 years. Um, um, my, my last role in, uh, in the federal service was uh, the CIO of Department of Homeland Security. Prior to that, I was the CIO. Of Department of Justice, and then uh, prior to that, CIO of one of the operating components inside of Department of Homeland Security. So it was there in the beginning, prior to 9/11, and then when it formed, uh, you know, at that point, that's when Homeland Security was formed. So I, I, I was part of that organization, stayed there for several years, and then moved over to the Department of Justice, and then back. 
And that's one of the things I want to point out. Uh, I think most of you are veterans. Is that right, Romney? All of them? It's about 75%, right? Okay, well, um, uh, for all of you, uh, thank you for everything you're doing. And, and for all the veterans, thank you for your service. Um, I will tell you that's one of the um, one of the real benefits of federal service. Of, uh, obviously, the mission is the uh, is the ultimate benefit, but the fungibility that you have in your career, right? You might start uh, a, a role over at Department of Justice. You might be at the FBI. You can move over to CISA under Department of Homeland Security. Go work for the Secret Service. Go work for the Park Service. Right, uh, go work for the Department of Energy, and and you're in sort of the the federal service ecosystem. So, all the things in regards to your years of service and retirement, and those sort of things, you know, they, they'll follow you along the way on your path. But there's a, a variety of roles and missions uh, that you can uh, you can get involved in, and that's what really sticks to a lot of folks is the mission, right? I mean, I think that's why many of you uh, joined uh, the, the different services. It's certainly uh, what, what, what uh, sort of I got the bug for. Uh, people used to ask me all the time, what do you do? And I say, I protect the United States of America. And, and it really meant that and I felt good about that. It made me uh, very proud. Uh, what, uh, what is the federal service like? Uh, well, it's, it's somewhat like the military, right? I'm going to speak specifically about Department of Homeland Security. And it turns out that there are a lot of folks from the military that end up in the Department of Homeland Security. About 30% of uh, the Department of Homeland Security is made up of former military members, a lot of them in reserves as well, still that kind of thing. A lot of the leadership um, are, are folks that came from the, uh, the military. And the Department of Homeland Security, Department of Justice, FBI, I'm sure, uh, which is of course part of the Department of Justice, uh, very interested in hiring veterans uh, for a lot of different reasons. Again, if you think about it, there's a lot of the percentage of folks that are in those organizations that are uh, prior military. And so they understand the, the uh, they, they had the experience, right? They understand the training, the leadership, you get the team uh, elements of it, et cetera. And, and that appeals to them, so they seek that. The other thing that I think is really important, and you may or may not know this, but when you're applying for a job in the federal service, um, they are very interested that, that there's nothing better than to see a veteran show up on what they call a certification, which is sort of a list that you would look to, to select somebody that also has the cyber skills you're looking for. And the veterans actually have what they call veteran preference. And, and, and you know, it's just a, a, a thing inside the federal government where, where they recognize the, the, uh, and the value of the military service and they actually get preferential treatment and get risen to the top of that list. Uh, which is incredibly valuable. So uh, your, your chances of, um, uh, of sort of making your way to the top of that list are greatly increased because you're a veteran. And quite frankly, if you're a veteran that has um, uh, had any type of injury under certain circumstances, you get even higher on that list. And, uh, and that's something that, um, uh, of course, for any hiring manager out there is gonna be incredibly value, right? I was in the mil I wasn't in the military, by the way, but let's say I was in the military. I'm a federal service hiring manager. I see somebody that came from the Navy. I was from the Navy or from the Marine Corps. I know what kind of training they got. They're at the top of the list, slam dunk, right? So just understand that. You can go to usajobs.gov and you'll you can apply for any of those cyber roles that are in there. You know, name your agency, name your role. And then the rest of that that I'm talking about, as far as the veterans preference, et cetera, that all happens automatically on the background. You don't do anything. You just simply apply for that job and, and it'll ask you about your, your veteran uh, uh, background and then it'll do some sort of a calculation. I don't pretend to know exactly how that works, uh, but I know it does work. And I know there's a lot of value in that, which is why we see 30% in DHS. CISA, which I want to talk about um, for a moment, that is a element inside the Department of Homeland Security. You may or may not have heard about it. It's a cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency. 
uh, prior to that being formed, it was a, a bigger agency that had some other pieces fit to it. And over the last couple of years, they stripped that out and made it just uh, explicitly focused on all of the cyber activities. And that is critical infrastructure, uh, which the gentleman from the FBI was talking about. The uh, CISA is very involved with the national infrastructure and protecting the national infrastructure working with all the various critical infrastructure sectors. It is also responsible for the what they call the .gov domain, uh, which means they have overarching responsibility for policy and a variety of other activities to protect that, that domain uh, from, uh, from um, uh, you know, uh, ne nefarious uh, actors that want to get in there and disturb the environment, such as what happened with solar wind. So as you can imagine, CISA has been extremely busy between solar winds, right, which was a big deal inside the federal government, along with outside the set federal government, and things like the pipeline situation that happened recently, right? They're, they're very active in that, of course, along with the FBI and others. So I will also say that uh, just a little bit of marketing in regards to CISA, they're getting a lot of attention from the Biden administration, this current administration, and from the Congress in the form of funds and uh, extended authority. Just recently under the COVID bill, uh, CISA got over $600 million associated to it, be, got uh, uh, some authorities also granted to it. Uh, the White House just issued an executive order giving CISA more authorities. Uh, both of those, by the way, I'm going to put a link in the chat so you can see those and reference those later. Uh, but the point there is this administration uh, because again, because of some of the events, along with all the all the other reasons why you would obviously be very focused on this, uh, has got a very hard focus and emphasis on ensuring that that uh, particular agency and across the national security uh, gets uh, gets all the resources that they need. So one of the things that they need are personnel. And I've talked extensively with those folks over there and they're on a hiring boom right now because they have a lot of responsibility, a lot of authority, a lot of money, and they need resources to execute all those things. So it's a fantastic time to try to enter into that particular workforce. That's not the only cyber uh, um, uh, area. It's just one that the exclusive responsibility of that organization is cyber. But I will tell you, Every single agency across the federal government has a cyber responsibility, right? They need to protect their environment um, from all the obvious things that we, 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 we talk about and we're taught about and that you all are learning about. So name your agency, right? That can, again, be the Department of Energy, right? The nukes, uh, protecting all those sort of things. It can be Department of Justice. It can be Department of Homeland Security and all the entities within that. Uh, it can be a uh, Department of Labor, quite frankly. People don't think about something like U.S. agriculture, but there's a lot of commodity information that it turns out these, uh, these uh, foreign actors are very interested in uh, from an espionage standpoint. So there's a whole bunch of activity in regards to whether it's a SOC analyst, right? Whether it's uh, um, uh, a, a, uh, you know, a hardcore bare metal type person, uh, there's a lot of different types of roles that you can play in the federal service. And, and, and again, uh, once you sort of enter into the federal service, there's a lot of lateral movement that can be um, uh, had. I will tell you just from my own experience that working with a lot of folks that uh, came from the military, several of them that worked for me, uh, the civilian government I'm going to talk about in particular, even though it's I'll say sort of paramilitary, right? There's, there's a lot of uniform folks or special agents, et cetera, in a variety of these different kinds of roles. It is not as structured as the military. And that's something that a lot of folks have to sort of learn uh, as they, they move into these careers that it's, you know, in the military, and again, I don't pretend to know all the particulars, but if you wanna get from this rank to this rank to this rank to this rank, 
uh, it's a fairly clear, you know, line uh, that you can draw there on what you need to do and the different types of roles you need to play in skills and training, et cetera. It's not quite that crystal clear in the, in the uh, federal government, the civilian government. There's a lot of good training, et cetera. There are structured um, uh, programs in parts of the civilian government, but some of it is uh, again, just not as structured and as military precision, let me say, as the military. Uh, but I will tell you that, again, I'll say it one more time, there's a lot of folks across sort of the national security element. I'll say State Department, Department of Energy, Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security, that have a lot of former military folks in their ranks, a lot of them in these hiring decisions. They understand and value what the military has brought. That's why they seek these folks out. A lot of times fight over them. Let me stop there for a moment Luke, and let you all I, ask some questions. Okay, Luke, may I ask you please to introduce the cyber competition we, as a national director for the US Cyber Challenge, how that can benefit our cybersecurity student in this program to give them exposed to cyber competition and get the field recent real award. Sure, uh, and I apologize because I, I, didn't, I didn't announce my current position. Uh, which I am the national director of U.S. Cyber Challenge, and and the and the uh, the um, the whole idea, the goal, and the mission of the U.S. Cyber Challenge is to again uh, continue to try to, to address the, uh, the 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 huge gap of silent cyber talent that's in the uh, in the United States, and they do that through the form of various educations, primarily the marquee education is the cyber camps that we, we uh, provide. And these are uh, sort of boot camps, if you will. They're a week long, uh, very intensive camps. And I'll, I'll, I'll put a link out there to them. You can actually see the, the, uh, the, the, the schedule for the two camps. We're having two virtual camps this year. Uh, you go through a competition online and get graded. If you score high, you get invited to the camps. Uh, right now, we're charging $185 for a week long of cyber uh, um, instruction immersion. Uh, it's the majority of the instructors are SANS instructors. A couple of them are the top SANS instructors in, in the country. And they hit you with a fire hose and, and really uh, give you a lot of intense, in some cases, bare metal type cyber instruction, if you will. But weaved into that, which is one of the things that we've learned in talking to CIOs, and I've experienced this myself, is, look, we need in the, uh, in, in the community, we need some geeks that, geeks that can speak, I like to call it, right? And so we, we, we also teach the students, uh, we give them a, a course on how to write a resume. Uh, we give them a course on ethics, right? Because a lot of times there are some some dynamics there and some decision making that you have to make. And so we, we, we do a, a little session on ethics. We bring people in from either Secret Service, FBI, Department of Justice attorneys, and we run them through some scenarios and then give them some and, and, and ask them how, how would you do react to a situation like that? And then uh, give them some feedback on based on uh, their answers, sort of real world environment there. Uh, we also do a, a CIO CISO roundtable where you have the opportunity to ask CISOs that perhaps are in the federal service or other areas. Some of them are, are former uh, CISOs or former CIOs or current CIOs about what it's like to be a CIO or what they're expecting in regards to uh, a CIO, what they're expecting their CISO to do or their SOC to do or their, their NOSC as we like to call it these days, et cetera. So it's, it's a very intensive week. At the end of the week, we do a capture the flag activity where there's a competition. We team up the, uh, the various members into teams. They compete against each other. Whoever wins at the camp goes on to the national championship. We have a cyber bowl in October where the camps, the number one and the number two teams in each camp compete against each other. Whoever wins that gets crowned the, uh, the national champion and uh, come to Washington sort of virtually, if you will, participate in a cyber summit where there's a lot of other federal leaders in there uh, and, uh, and then get recognized formally at that event. Right, and also we would like to mention in, during the, the regional boot camps, we have a virtual job for us. So we have invited a lot of private and public sectors also 
that's really important for them to, they could actually get to see a lot of employers and talk to them about jobs and cybersecurity. Forgot to mention that. I really do appreciate that. And so you'll see people like McAfee there, Google, GDIT, ServiceNow, CIS is going to be there. Department of Homeland Security proper is going to be there. Probably a couple other federal agencies. And it's uh, again, virtual now. So it, it's, uh, it's a bit of a speed dating type thing where we put folks in teams. Uh, we let the, uh, the various um, employers explain sort of what their situation is. Uh, how they hire folks, what they do as far as internships, et cetera. And then, uh, and then they break out into teams and they just go round robin and they drop into a virtual room and uh, get a more extended pitch on ServiceNow, McAfee, Google, whatever the, uh, or CISA. And then they can just fire away and ask questions. Uh, and that's been very valuable as well. Thank you very much, Luke. Really appreciate the information. I'd just like to mention to everybody here, guys, also the National Cyber League, the, your, your Cyber Challenge uh, also provide you with the opportunity to move to a professional environment. I have a lot of my students now work for Homeless Security, CESA, they work for Raytheon, Lucky Martin, and some other companies. And we're very proud of them, especially my female cybersecurity student. We'd like to see more of them participate in the cybersecurity field. Thank you, Luke. Yeah, for um, federal government loves their veterans. And, uh, and I heard some questions being asked about virtual look. What COVID taught us is that we don't have to all physically be in the building, right? If you're in an environment where you're in a skiff, et cetera, a different kind of situation. But these knocks and socks have gone virtual these days. And so there's a real opportunity now to expand the aperture. And the federal service loves that because 80% of them were in Washington and now they can open up their area of, of, of responsibility and tap into uh, resources all over the country. Thank you very much, Luke. Really appreciate your information here. All right, Amber, you wanna take it from here? Yeah, well, thank you so much for uh, our guest speakers and for everybody for joining us tonight and bearing with us as we had our uh, interesting technical glitch with breakout rooms. We really appreciate everybody's patience as we worked through that. Um, does anybody have any last questions? I, I know that we're running long, so if you need to leave, feel free to leave. Um, the session is being recorded and I will um, email that out to the link out to people later this week. So, you know, don't feel that you need to stay um, if you have other pressing matters. But if you have questions, here's your chance. If nobody has any questions, I, I guess I just had one last comment. Um, you know, as you all get into these sessions and start on the um, the coursework, um, you know, there's plenty of, of resources out there for you within this program. Uh, please contact your program managers you were assigned to, your instructors. Um, we're going to have some... Um, some support analysts, um, that kind of thing. So um, just don't fall off the face of the earth <laughs> once you start, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions of, you know, to somebody. Um, if it's not the right person, we will find you the answers to it. And, um, and, and just, we're here for your support to get you guys through this program um, as we go through it. So don't be afraid to ask questions and, and, and just let us know what's going on and if, if you're struggling with things um, so that we can help you. And thank you, Chrissy, for mentioning that. We do also have a support actually groups here. The already in the cyber program have done this work before. We have Michael Hillman is here. We also have Cody Walters here. And also we have Eileen is here. We also have Daniel Exabolus is also was here, but he left early because he had to go to work. So we do have a group of support students who could actually, you know, help you in your cybersecurity uh, education here, part of the PWCP. So please make sure you reach out to your instructor. He can point you in the direction who can really help you for this homework assignment. If you get any technical problems, you can reach out, of course, to the, to the instructors, but also we have this uh, cybersecurity analyst, support analyst, I should say. They work part-time for us and they can also have great help to you. So I, I actually sent you four links. One was a news article that sort of outlines that the funding that the Biden administration allocated 
uh, two was the executive order that I referenced that uh, in, empowers CISA and, and a lot of other things that uh, they're expecting the uh, federal service to do in regards to cyber. Three was the uh, scholarship for service. And you can read that. That's a program that's uh, available through CISA. And then four is the actual uh, camp uh, schedule for the two camps that we were talking about. You can see the instruction there, intensive week. Uh, there, but you can see all the various activities that happen in those camps. Great. Thank you very much, Luke, for that information. Really appreciate you coming here. You know, you're very busy getting ready. Me and Luke, actually, we're running the U.S. Cyber Challenge actually very soon, June 7th. So that's mm -hmm. our first we're meeting right now. We're trying to get everything done. Okay, I'm going to sign off again, once again, to all the veterans. Really appreciate it. Thank you for your service and for everyone else, for everything else that you're doing to keep this country safe. Rami, we'll see you soon. See you soon. Thank you, Luke. Thanks for Bye coming. Now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Wonderful. Any last questions? Otherwise, everybody is free to go and enjoy their night or whatever time zone you're in. Maybe you're early morning, I don't know. <laughs>